Welcome to the Science for the Public lecture series. Science for the Public is an organization committed to bringing science information and issues to the general public. Visit our website for our program listings and blog. Uh, I want to thank the Friends of the Belmont Public Library. They sponsor events like this. Um, and I want to especially thank Yvonne Stapp, the Director of Science for the Public. She coordinated this event that you guys are getting to enjoy today. I'm going to let her come up and introduce Daniel. Um, but let's give a round of applause for Yvonne. Good evening, I'm Yvonne Stapp for Science for the Public and I welcome you to tonight's special lecture, Clouds, Chemistry and Climate Change, Why Our Current Climate Is What It Is. Our speaker is Dan Zitzo, Professor of Atmospheric Chemistry at MIT. Dr. Zitzo is an expert on the relationship between clouds and climate, so it is our very great fortune, well-timed this week to have him after following following the, the two massive hurricanes, uh, Harvey and Irma. Although clouds and the particles that produce them are core features of climate and climate change, we don't really hear about this process. So after tonight, we'll all have a much better understanding of how climate scientists analyze this complex relationship between atmosphere and ocean and these particles in the atmosphere that all affect the Earth's climate. Dr. Fitzo is an expert on the atmospheric particles that produce the clouds and how clouds regulate Earth's temperature. Tonight he's going to explain to us what this work reveals about Earth's present and future climate. He'll discuss also why the excess CO2 in the atmosphere will continue to remain a problem and he's promised to also mention uh, something you may not have heard about called geoengineering. Quite a controversial thing and he's going to give you the facts tonight about this. Dr. Tsitso has been involved in major atmospheric missions for NASA and maybe he'll tell us a bit about that too. And he's received numerous awards. He is one of my favorite translators of technical information for non-experts like the rest of us and we are very honored to welcome him tonight. Thank you. Thanks. So uh, it's an absolute pleasure being here. And uh, I actually wanted to say thank you first to Belmont Public Library for having me out, um, just for the chance to talk to you guys today. Um, and also to uh, Yvonne for uh, all of her work at Science for the Public. Um, it's been a great outreach opportunity for me in particular, but I think for our community in general. Um, which is this idea that we put a lot of money into uh, science, technology, engineering, math education for kids that are in grade school, but we sort of forget about people after they get to high school. And I think that the work she's been doing is absolutely critical, which is that, you know, as we all get older, we still want to learn things, we want to find out new things, we want to get information. Um, and how do we do that? And I think science for the public is absolutely critical. Um, and so uh, Yvonne already gave you the title of, of what I'm going to be talking to you guys about today. Um, she asked me to uh, add a little bit to, to what I normally talk about. So we're going to talk a little bit about CO2, carbon dioxide, and its fate in the atmosphere. And then she asked me to say a few things about geoengineering, which is a topic uh, that is very controversial right now. Um, I am not a proponent of it. I'll try to lay it out for you and, and allow you guys to make an informed decision about it. Um, what I will say is that uh, this is a, a great audience and it's a pleasure to be here. So don't wait until the end for questions. If you raise a hand, I will definitely break. If something's not clear or you guys want to, to talk about something, I think we should go into that in, in more depth. So don't feel bad about that. I always tell my class the worst thing it can do is hold their questions till the end and then forget what they were or not go down a path that you know we all want to go down. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll, I'll launch right into it uh, with one of my favorite quotes. And I, I think it's a great way to get talking about climate. 
because what we're going to do first is talk a little bit about climate and then we'll get into our special area which is particles in the atmosphere and the clouds that they spawn. So this is George Santayana's quote, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And so what does that mean for climate? It means that we really have to think about the climate of this planet, not just today, yesterday, last week, but, but really over thousands of years. Um, I think that we're often made to think that the climate of the planet is somehow very stable and that is absolutely contrary to the evidence that we have. So this is a time series and, and on the bottom axis it's going back almost a million years, 800,000 years in time. And this says what the temperature of the planet is and, and that's on the y axis here. And there's this number over here which is zero which just means it's the same as some arbitrary number and you can pick what that number out is. It could be what it was today, it could be last year, it could be 10 years from now, it could be anything that you want it to be. Um, scientists normally get together and we pick out this, myst this mystical year of 1750. Um, the reason we do that is that people normally agree that that's before the Industrial Revolution, it's before humans really had an impact on the world around them. And so that zero that we pick out is, is some climate that was around this planet about 250 some odd years ago. And what you can see is if you go back in time, climate's swinging back and forth. It's a little bit warmer um, at times than it was today. At other times, it's much, much colder. So this is in degrees Celsius, which is a little bit over a degree Fahrenheit, the, the degrees that we commonly use in the U.S. As scientists, we tend to use degrees C. But you can see that it can be as much as 8 degrees cooler. And so this is no surprise. Most people have heard about these periods in Earth's climate. These are ice ages, and we came out of our last one something over 10, 15,000 years ago, and, and so that would be the last blue arrow on there. There's also so-called interstitial periods. These mean periods between ice ages when it's somewhat warmer. So what causes this? This is natural climate change. This is not something that humans had an impact on. Humans, anatomically modern humans were around for a lot of this record, but of course we weren't at the beginning of it. And we really didn't have an impact on the planet. And so this is not new science. This was actually worked out in the 1920s. A very smart uh, scientist, Milankovitch, figured this out. And what he realized was that these climate cycles, the warm periods, the cold periods, correlated with orbital mechanics. They, con they, they correlated with how our planet moves around the sun. And so what's often thought of is that the Earth is something like a top. And you can think of if you spin a top, it's spinning around, but it's not stable. It starts moving like this. It might move around like that. And so all of these orbital parameters change over thousands and thousands of years, just like that top is spinning around or it's precessing around. And Milankovitch worked all of this out, and people have been doing this better over time and, and trying to figure it out. But he sort of picked out that there were three or four really important features in the Earth's orbit around the sun that contributed to the climate of the planet, it being a little further away, a little bit closer, that uh, we were spinning so that summertime was during the months of July in the northern hemisphere, that wintertime was sort of around December in the northern hemisphere and the opposite in the southern hemisphere. And so he, he worked all of this out. And so this is, uh, by the way, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll leave this uh, at the bottom, but, but the source of where this all comes from is always recorded at the bottom just so that you know uh, what I'm talking about. Um, so this is uh, from Universe Today, and what they did was they, they've shown very nicely here that that tilt is here, the eccentricity of the orbit is here, this is that precession, that top-like behavior, all of the, the, the different factors, and if you add those together, you come up with this uh, number that's called daily insulation. That's a fancy term for saying it's sort of like the amount of sunlight that's reaching the Earth because of all of those features. And then at the bottom you see these two records, and so these are temperature proxies, and I'll talk more about these in just a minute, but this is a way of seeing what the temperature of the planet is. And so what Milankovitch was able to do was look backwards in time and realize that these different parameters, when you added them up, led to what the temperature of the planet was. And so this is why the temperature of our planet changes over a long period of time. So that's over thousands of years. But if you look at shorter time periods, Earth isn't really changing its orbit around the sun. Those things aren't really changing over time. And instead, there's different things that are forcing the climate system. So for us to understand this, what we can do is acknowledge that there's these ice ages and these interstitial periods. But we really want to zoom in on what's going on right now, or maybe over the last few thousand years, while we've had a human civilization going on.
So we can do that. We can sort of zoom in on that part of the climate record. And so now on the x-axis, this is year. This is not hundreds of thousands of years anymore. This is a couple thousand years. You can sort of think of this going back to, you know, the Roman Empire or something like that. And now we have global temperature on the other axis there. And the first thing that I'd like you to notice is that even while we have these huge climate swings over hundreds of thousands of years, this temperature is very stable. It's saying that the average global temperature, and this is the idea that you take the temperature everywhere on the surface of the planet, uh, over the course of a year you add it up and you average it, that global temperature has changed really by no more than about a half a degree Celsius, something just under one degree Fahrenheit over those thousands of years. There's a couple different colors here, and so we should sort of talk about these a little bit more and, and think about what they mean. So first off, you'll notice that before this year, 1880, and this is another magical year for scientists that I'll talk about in just a moment, before that, the temperature record is in this sort of yellow gold color on here. And for the folks in the front row, you can see that that's surrounded by this sort of shaded region. The reason that it's that color is that we as scientists acknowledge that we didn't really have very many accurate thermometers before about 1880. So if we want to understand the temperature of the planet, we have to use things that are called proxies. We have to look at things like tree rings and see how wide they are, how fast trees were going, how good the climate was for them to grow. We can do things like look at air bubbles past climates, past air that's trapped in, in ice in glaciers and that type of thing. We can also look at the record that's in stalactites and caves and things like that. And so this can all be worked out to figure out what the temperature is. That's not as good as a thermometer and that's the reason for this shaded region here which acknowledges that we're not very certain about it. We think that it was this temperature but it could have been somewhat higher and it could have been somewhat lower and so we're acknowledging that. Now in 1880, this magic year, that's when we not only had thermometers, we, we had had them for some years, number of years before, but now we've had enough of them around the planet that we can start thinking about a global temperature and making that record. Um, that sounds like it's fairly recent, but believe it or not, Blue Hills, which is just south of us, was actually the first temperature record in the United States, and it started in 1884. And so that's why this year is there. Even in the U.S., we didn't have a temperature record going on, a climate record going on before the mid-1880s. And so what you'll see is that that temperature is very, very constant over this period of time. There's a few weird features that are going on in here. So there's these periods that look like they're a little bit colder. There's the so-called Little Ice Age. There's some volcanic eruptions, and we'll talk more about those later. They put a lot of particles into the atmosphere that scattered sunlight away, and it got colder. There's another period that's often called the Medieval Warm Period. And what you'll notice is that even though it was called the Medieval Warm Period, and everybody talks about how wonderful it is, it was actually cooler than it is now, today. Um, but what is very striking is this increase sometime after that temperature record started, really within the last few decades, where temperature has started taking off very quickly. And so what I'll remind you is, although we know that there's natural climate forcings due to orbital mechanics, this is not orbital mechanics. It cannot happen that fast. This is a, a rapid change in time that has a fingerprint of a, of a couple decades. So it's not what we talked about that Milankovic figured out. It's got to be something different. Um, one last thing that I'll, I'll make a point about is that this you can think of as being sort of the record of human civilization. There were cities, there was agriculture that went back some thousands of years before that. The same type of climate record, the same stability was there. And so those wild swings in temperature that you saw earlier, there were, again, anatomically modern humans for a large part of that, but they didn't make a civilization. And there's been a lot of scientists that have looked at this and talked about that civilization and stable climate is not an accident, that there's a lot of evidence that having a stable climate allows you to build cities, make agriculture, populate regions. And you'll see that, again, we've had this very stable climate. And so I just want to hammer home the point that this is really important for civilization is having that stable climate. We're starting to now get outside of a region that we know anything about. We don't know how civilization responds to warmer temperatures than this or much colder temperatures, to, to be quite honest with you. So I mentioned that this can't be a forcing that's due to orbital mechanics, that there has to be something else going on. And we have a hint of what this is, and that's carbon dioxide. So if we go back in time, we can see that as climate changes, there's also changes of things other than just orbital mechanics. We also have carbon dioxide changing in the atmosphere. 
And I'll talk about this being natural, and then we'll talk about the effect that humans can have on this in, in a few moments. But what you can see on this plot is that temperature uh, is on here in blue on the upper panel, and the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere is on here in the lower panel in the red color here. And you can sort of see these swings as temperature goes up, CO2 is up. When temperature is down, CO2 is down. And so this is sort of giving us a hint that maybe there's something else to look at here for us to understand what could force climate over a few decades and not over a few millennia. So uh, if you watch the nightly news, you watch a bit on YouTube or you read uh, the paper, um, what you'll think is that you know, we're just starting to figure out climate. Um, one of the things that I want to get across to you guys tonight is that that's absolutely not true. Um, we as humans have been concerned about climate and trying to understand the Earth and the Earth system for hundreds of years now. And so uh, this is a, a, a sort of a personal hero of mine. This is John Tyndall. He was a Brit. He was working in sort of the mid-1800s. Um, the reason I like him is that I'm an experimentalist. I go out and do field work. I build instruments in the laboratory. And that's what Tyndall did as well. Um, so this is an instrument that he had called a, a, a comparative spectrometer. The idea here was that he was able to put different materials in this tube like structure, and then he could put different types of energy through it. You can think of that as being sunlight or heat, and he'd see what was in the tube and how it would react with the heat or the light that was being put through it. And then he would report back on this. And so Tyndall was really interested in the atmosphere and the effect that it could have on things like sunlight coming down, as well as the heat of the planet as, as the planet was trying to sort of, re, as it was trying to radiate that heat out into space. And so at first what he decided to do was put, you know, the major components of the atmosphere into his spectrometer. He put oxygen in there, he put nitrogen in there, and lo and behold, he figured out it did nothing. It scattered a little bit of sunlight when he put light through it. It didn't do anything to heat from the earth or, or anything like that. It wasn't until he started putting some strange stuff, some very low concentration materials, carbon dioxide and ozone into it, that he started to get a result. They didn't do much to sunlight, but what he realized was that heat that the planet was trying to give off got sort of trapped by the material in this spectrometer and re-radiated. So if he tried to put heat through it, it didn't just pass through. That material would absorb that heat and then re-radiate it, and his spectrometer would warm up. And so he's got this famous quote where he talks about how the Earth would be in an icy grip if it wasn't for these low concentration species like carbon dioxide and ozone being in our atmosphere. And so he's worked out the first part of climate change, the first part of human-induced climate change, that is, when he realized that there's these materials in the atmosphere that are really important for maintaining the temperature of our planet. I need to give a, a quick shout out to Eunice Foote on the first line here. So Eunice Foote uh, was a scientist, a contemporary of Tyndall's. She was working in Cambridge, our Cambridge, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, at almost the same time in the mid-1800s. Um, it turns out that uh, at that point in time, we were perhaps not quite as evolved as we are now. We did not allow women to present at scientific conferences. So that's something that's changed in the last 150, 170 years, um, much for the better. Um, Eunice was a fantastic scientist. She worked a lot of this out at the same time or figured a lot of this out. She then had to pick a man to go give presentations at scientific conferences for her. Um, if she had any shortcoming, it was perhaps in picking the person to present her material. It turns out that she didn't do a very good job of that and whoever was presenting that material was not very engaging and a lot of it was lost as, it went through, as, it, as we went through the years. And so Tyndall got a lot of the, the glory for this and Eunice lost out on this. There was a really nice article in the New York Times about her, I think it was a, a little bit over a year ago, one of my colleagues brought it to my attention. And uh, I think she's gotten a nice write-up in the Globe and a few places like that. Um, so it's a, it's a fascinating story and it's somebody I think if you pay attention to climate that you'll start hearing more about over the next few years. Okay, so we're still talking about natural climate and what's happening in, in the Earth system. And so Tyndall, again, is, is working out most of, of how this happens. And, and this has been, you know, over the subsequent decades sort of figured out. And so you can think of CO2 as being this sort of stabilizing element of our climate system. CO2 is, is being put out by, by various activities. You know, you can think of a natural one being volcanoes erupting and putting CO2 into the atmosphere. So that's helping to keep the planet warm by keeping some of our heat in, acting like a blanket over the surface. But if those volcanoes just kept erupting, that would mean more and more CO2 and the planet would keep warming up. And we obviously know that's not happening. So there's something that's stabilizing it. And so quite naturally, one of the things that we realize is that CO2 makes its way into the ocean. It combines 
often with other materials, um, things like rocks that are being weathered, and you end up getting this material calcium carbonate. And this sediments out, finds its way down in, into the sediment, and, and, and then it's trapped. And so this is a perfectly natural cycle, and it keeps CO2 at a relatively even keel in the atmosphere. You can think about the ice ages we talked about earlier and the part that CO2 is playing. Ice ages, less plants, so CO2 is going to go up. Plants are not using CO2. What's going to happen? You sort of kick in this sediment thing. CO2 goes up. It helps get the temperature of the, the planet up. It helps get you out of an ice age. At that point, the plants start taking up more CO2. So this is a nice sort of happy balance. And you can think of the Earth sort of going back and forth through these different climate periods over time, but sort of self-regulating and, and self-stabilizing. But again, the key again here is this is over thousands or even millions of years. These are not things that are happening over a few tens of years. And so this is just sort of graphically saying what I just said. You can think of these volcanoes putting out CO2. Atmospheric CO2 goes up. The planet temporarily warms. You have a bit of weathering. You make more of this calcium carbonate. That gets trapped. CO2 goes back down. The temperature of the planet returns. Everybody's happy. You get sort of these long time swings. That's all well and good. The planet was going on for millions, billions of years uh, in a perfectly happy fashion, somewhat warmer, somewhat colder, and so on. And then humans came along. So what effect were we having? Well, this is just sort of an accounting of, of what's been going on. Um, I kind of like it because it's 1970, which was the year I was born, so it sort of tells you what's been going on since, since that time. And so what you can see here is this is CO2 from uh, fossil fuel combustion as well as from other sources, but from human activities. And you can see that over the years, there's CO2 that's being emitted by those activities. This is not natural. This is what we as scientists call anthropogenic or, or human-induced. And so this is putting material into the atmosphere that we know has an effect on the climate of the planet. And not only are we putting material in, but every year that's ticked by has been a little bit more of that material. So it's not, it's putting that material, but every year a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. And you can see that that's constantly keep, it's constantly gone up. And so that's the amount that we know is being put there. We can sort of do an accounting again of, you know, the number of power plants, the number of cars and so on. We can also measure what's in the atmosphere. So we can go out and we can stick measurement uh, devices on the top of the roof and we can look and see how much CO2 is there. And so that's what's being done here um, on the, the y-axis and the left axis. This is the amount of CO2. This is PPM. That stands for parts per million. So you can think of uh, a million molecules in the atmosphere. If you did that, uh, there would be in the year 1970 again, so this, this year that uh, the last one started out at, it would be about 320 of those molecules would be CO2. We can fast forward to 2010, and it's something over 390. Um, if anybody uh, was reading the news about a year, year and a half ago, we hit 400. And so nobody in this room will live in a world that has less than 400 parts per million CO2 in the atmosphere again. That's sort of in the rear view mirror. We're going to keep going up. And so these two are directly related. We're putting CO2 into the atmosphere. We're putting more every year. And we can see the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere rising as a response to that. Um, this is just a quick quote from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report, and they just say that, you know, within that last 800,000 years where we have this sort of nice proxy record, CO2 is higher than at any time in the past. It's about 40% higher than this, this mythical year of 1750 before human activities, before the Industrial Revolution took over. And so we have to sort of update that slide that I showed you earlier with this sort of nice cycle, this nice balance going on of CO2 being put out and then slowly being taken out of the system by, by rocks weathering by deposition. And so now we have factories in here, which is sort of just meaning, you know, human activities. And so what are these doing? They're producing that CO2. They're putting it into the atmosphere. The atmospheric amount of CO2 is rising. A consequence of that is that there's more CO2 going into the oceans, and people here have probably heard about ocean acidification. That's CO2 going into the oceans. And you also have an increase in photosynthesis. There's evidence that we have more plants now, more material in, in the biosystem as they respond to that food that they have, the, the CO2 that's in the atmosphere. So all of these things are increasing because of this human addition of CO2. And this is sort of knocking the system a little bit out of whack. Okay, so 
Who is it that first sort of considered the concept of humans putting CO2 in, into the atmosphere? Tyndall was just working on how did the climate system work. Svant Arrhenius in the late 1800s, early 1900s, was figured out how humans could affect this. So this is his famous quote. And basically he's saying here, if we increase the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, that we can expect that there's going to be a rise in temperature. You put something in there that helps trap heat, something like a blanket, what's going to happen? Your temperature is going to go up as a result. Svant was the first one that worked out something that we as scientists call climate sensitivity. And it's this idea that if you take an amount of CO2 and you double it, so pre-industrially that was about 300 parts per million, if you double it, say, to 600 parts per million, what kind of a temperature increase would you get? So he worked out the math on this, and he said it was about five and a half degrees C. This is something I tell my students never to do. He wrote a paper and said it was about five and a half degrees C. Then he realized he had made a math mistake. So what do you do? Svant wrote another paper. So he made a mistake, but he got two papers out of it. That's not a good role model for students nowadays. I tell them not to try that, but he did revise it, and he revised it correctly for the math that he was doing down to about four degrees C. So again, you know, about a degree, degree and a half Fahrenheit, so about six degrees Fahrenheit. This was the first estimate that we had of climate sensitivity. So again, humans put the CO2 in, we double it, what's the temperature rise? So very often, you'll notice at this point that I'm a bit of a science history buff. Um, People say, oh, this Fontarrhenius guy, I mean, he was really thinking ahead. The Industrial Revolution had just barely kicked off, and he's worried about climate change. Absolutely not true. He was writing a paper, and this came out in 1908. Um, Svant was a Scandinavian. He was from Sweden. And so he was interested in burning coal intentionally to increase CO2 because he thought Scandinavia was too cold. He actually writes about how he's tired of the cold winters in Scandinavia. And so what he's going to do is he's going to light the coal fields of northern Europe on fire, increase the temperature, make it nicer in Scandinavia. He thought then the agricultural region would move north, you know, it would sort of move out of Germany into Scandinavia. He didn't seem to write very much about what would happen in places like southern Europe and Africa. He was very sort of, you know, Scandinavia-centric at this point in time. But that's how we all got started in this climate world. So one of the things that Yvonne asked me to talk to you guys about today was what's the ultimate fate of this CO2? And, and we've already mentioned this, but it, it should be pretty obvious by now. If you put that CO2 in, the way that Earth, the way that our Earth system tackles it is to draw that down. And so there's weathering of rocks, production of this calcium carbonate, sedimentation and, and sequestra sequestration of that material. But it's not fast. It takes thousands of years. I use that quote from the paper that I showed you earlier, if you know, it's on the time scale of an order of a million years. So if we put CO2 into the atmosphere, if we drive here, um, if we go burn something at home, that CO2, those CO2 molecules are going to cycle through our Earth system. Some of them are going to stay in the atmosphere, some are going to make it into the ocean, but eventually they'll be removed from the Earth system. But it's not going to take place quickly. And so this is just a, a quick plot, and there's three different things that are being shown here. The important one is, is the concentration line, which is this black line right here. And so this is the amount of CO2, and you can see it rising till the year 2050. This is a projection. This is sort of saying that we as humans sort of get our act together in the next few decades, and we realize that we need to stop burning CO2. We need to stop emitting CO2. Even though we stop at that point in time, that CO2 doesn't go away immediately. And instead, what you have is what's called a forcing, the, the radiative effect of that material. And that's the solid line resulting in a temperature, which is the red line. And so those things lag. They take time to go away. And you can see this is going out several hundred years. So this is the year 2200. I'm pretty sure that nobody in this room is going to be around to worry about this. But CO2 that we have emitted now up to the year about 2050, which is going to be due to us, would still be causing effects temperature rise in the year 2200. In fact, this will continue on for about a thousand years. So just remember that when you drive home tonight that those CO2 molecules are going to be, you know, messing around with the atmosphere and changing things, changing the temperature for hundreds, even a thousand years. So it's not a problem that if you shut off the taps or you shut off the cars tomorrow, that it just goes away. This is a much longer term issue. So let's go back to Svant and sort of ask ourselves, well, how is he doing? So again, let's just sort of recap what we did in, in the first half of, of this talk. 
We've figured out as scientists that CO2 can have this effect on, on the temperature of the planet. We put more of that material into the atmosphere and we can see the temperature go up. Since the year 1880, when this rise was sort of already starting but, but really sort of accelerating, we've had modern temperature records. And so this is a plot a few decades later in the year 1900 and, and the difference between that and a few years ago, 2012. And this is saying if I had a temperature in the year 1900 and I had a, year, a temperature in the year 2012 and I was able to do that over the surface of the planet, how different would they be on average? And you can see that this is the temperature, this is zero, and these warm colors here means that the temperature in that location is warmer. There's some places that we don't have very good coverage. There's some places that have gotten a little bit cooler. But by and large, most of the planet has seen a warming, and that warming has been just under a degree C, so something just over a degree Fahrenheit. And so we know that that's happened because of the records. These are direct records that we have. In fact, if we sort of think about what the warmest years in history are, again, going back to 1880 when we've got these modern thermometers, the warmest years on record look like this. Does anything strike you about those years? They're all recent, right? They're all within my lifetime, certainly. I think they're within the lifetime of the folks that are largely within the lifetime of the folks that are, are within this room. When I first started doing this about 10 years ago, there were a few on here from the 1930s. And for those that read history, that was the Great Depression. That was the Dust Bowl era, which we sort of think about as being this remarkably warm period in our history and the history of our country. Those have all sort of like a Pez dispenser got knocked off as you, you pop the warmer years onto the top. So last year was the warmest year on record. The year before was the warmest year on record until last year and so on. There's a little variability in the system, but you can see the 2000s are largely in this sort of top 20, you know, the hits parade that we have on here. There's a few years from the 90s. The 90s are going to start getting knocked off for the 20 teens. The 2020s are going to come in and so on. And so this really does make sense. I mean, this is all in keeping with what we understand as, as scientists that's been worked out since the time of Tyndall. One of the questions, though, is how is our friend Svant doing? Remember, he estimated that if you double the amount of CO2, you get this 4 degrees centigrade change in temperature. But what I'm saying here is that carbon dioxide's gone up by about 50%. That should be about 2 degrees, and yet it's somewhat less than that. It's about a degree. So Svant's off. He's sort of missed something. If he was right, to be correct, CO2's gone up 43%. With his math, we multiply that. It should be about a degree 0.7, and it's only about half of that. So the question is, what did he miss? Why isn't it warmer now than it even is? It's already warmer, but why isn't it even warmer more than that? And so I'm just going to recap the first half. Greenhouse gases, mainly CO2, but there's a, a few other greenhouse gases, are trapping heat that would otherwise escape to space. That's a good thing. The temperature of this planet would be below 0 degrees C, below 32 degrees Fahrenheit if we didn't have any CO2. So be happy there's some CO2 there. But we as humans are putting CO2 into the atmosphere, and that's got to cause a change in the temperature of the planet. So however warm it was that we were happy with, it's going to be a little bit warmer because of that CO2. So what did Svant miss? Well, this is your hint, so I'm going to ask you what this picture is missing. And this is actually a picture. This is from the Japanese Space Agency. So what you can see is that they took this nice image of the Earth. It's actually a mosaic. They had a satellite in orbit, and they were able to take pictures, and they sort of stitched them together to make this beautiful image. And they intentionally took pictures at times that didn't have clouds. clouds. There's no clouds there. And so if you look at an image of the entire planet at any one time, and this is from NASA, this is from Apollo, it should look like that. And it's not just clouds. If you look very closely, there's also things like mineral dust storms that you can see. There's smoke plumes and things like that that are here that weren't in the Japanese Space Agency picture. Um, I love this image. I had this as a kid on my wall, but this is the correct one. So this is the heart of the research that, that we do, is understanding the effect that these clouds and that the particles that are in the atmosphere have on the climate of the planet. And so um, I'm not sure how obvious this is, as Vaughn mentioned when she was doing the introduction. I think that most of the folks in this room have heard about carbon dioxide and global warming, but it's a little bit more rare that you uh, have heard about things like particle effects and cloud effects on climate. 
And so I love this image. Uh, this is something that I think really speaks to why particles have an effect on the temperature of the planet. So this is Singapore. Uh, MIT, the school that I'm at, has a joint institute there. And one of my good colleagues actually spends about six months out of the year there. And so he was there in 2013. Um, he sent me a few pictures. They didn't turn out real well, so I had to grab this one from the BBC. Um, but this is Singapore with smoke over the city. And so what you can see is that this is otherwise a bright, clear blue day, just like we had in Boston today. And instead of seeing that blue, clear sky in the background, the sunlight's coming in, it's striking that smoke plume, and some of the radiation is being reflected back into space. The reason that it looks sort of blurry or diffuse is that some of that energy, some of those light photons are making it to the camera, and instead of making it to the surface of the planet. So I'm going to say this again. It's a bright, clear blue day. That sunlight should all be reaching the surface of the planet and warming it up, but it's not because it's hitting the particles and it's scattering all over the place. And some of that is hitting the camera. Some of it's going right back out into space and it's not able to warm the planet. So at this point, you might ask a question and say, well, smoke is natural. There's wildfires. You know, this isn't human activities. This is completely natural. That's not true. We actually know where the smoke came from. They were clearing land. They were clearing peat bogs around Singapore at this time so that they could use that land for cropland, agriculture, that type of thing. So these were wildfires that were set by humans where natural material was being burned to change land usage. So these are human-caused particles, just like the things that come out of smokestacks, uh, out of cars, out of that type of thing. This is just a different source of human-made particles, biomass burning, land usage changes. That smoke moves over the city, and as a result, the temperature of the city in this case, but really the temperature of the globe because of all these particles, goes down. So as scientists, we call this the direct effect. It's the direct effect of a particle interfering with sunlight and making the temperature of the planet cooler. So it turns out that particles are not only important directly, but they're also important indirectly. And what I mean by that is that at the heart of every droplet in every cloud, or every ice crystal in every cold cloud, is a particle that nucleated, that formed that droplet. That water had to condense somewhere. It just doesn't condense out of the atmosphere. It condenses on a particle. So if we agree that there's more particles now because of human activities, that means that there's more cloud droplets. There's more ice crystals as a result. There's more clouds. And as you saw in that image from NASA before, those clouds are white, they're bright, and so they're reflecting sunlight. So if you have more clouds, more coverage of clouds, you're going to end up with more scattering. You're going to end up with a lower temperature of the planet. Okay, I don't expect you to believe me. Um, I'm hoping that you'll believe this guy here. That's a joke. That's me in my lab. <laughs> And so this is some work that we did with Yvonne and Science for the pub public a while ago. And so this jar has no particles in it. And I've put some water. Let me take one second just so that I don't get too far ahead. This jar, it looks like one of those beer growlers that you might bring home from a brewery or something like that. Um, it, it actually does work that way. That's what they were made for, but we use them for something different. This is going to be a cloud chamber for our experiment. So what I've done is I've put some water into that jar to make clouds, this, the feedstock for clouds. And clouds normally form, if you see sunlight come down to the surface, it heats up the earth, the, you get convection, and so you get clouds sort of building up. And you can see this on most summer days. Today it was bright and blue, but we should have some clouds on Friday, and you'll be able to see this happen. So I can't sort of lift this up fast enough to simulate convection and, and that type of activity. So I have this nice little beer growler hooked up to a pump to drop the temperature. And so at this point in time, what I'm doing is putting my finger over the inlet to that. The pump's active, and so this is dropping in pressure. Do you see a cloud in it? No cloud, right? So I don't know what I'm talking about. You should probably go home right now. <laughs> That's not true. That is a filter. So what I've intentionally done to play a trick is I'm letting the temperature of that drop, the pressure of that drop, there's plenty of relative humidity in there, but there's no particles. There's no seeds for clouds to grow on. So this is trying to prove that you actually do need these particles to make clouds. So let's forward, fast forward just a little bit. Um, and so in this case, I'm going to put some particles in. So we talked about Singapore. We talked about these wildfires. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to light this match here. 
going to let the sulfur burn off of it, and I'm going to just try to make these biomass burning particles, these wildfire particles, with the little stick of the match there. And this, so this is a real wood match. So it's burning. All the sulfur is gone. There's just smoke. You can see the smoke. There's just a little bit of it. Now I put my finger over it, so this is full of particles. Now, all of a sudden, can you see the cloud form? There's the cloud. Nothing's changed except we went from no particles to particles. And so hopefully this is proof for you guys uh, to see that particles really are important. Now what I'm doing is I'm going through this is I'm taking my finger off, I'm letting fresh air in, the cloud dissipates, and then I put my finger back on. What you'll notice is even though it looks like everything's been pumped out of there, there's still another cloud forming every time that I do that. The cloud's changing its optical properties. It's becoming a little bit more gray, a little bit less reflective. But nonetheless, even just a few particles in there are able to make that cloud. I actually almost screwed up this experiment one time because I was doing it and I wasn't very careful about putting this filter on there. And I let a few particles in there so I could see that I was making a really thin cloud in there. But luckily, everybody in the audience couldn't see that. So if you have insomnia, um, you'll have this link. Uh, it'll be on the presentation. You can go home and watch this to your heart's content. So. This is a graph from that IPCC report, that Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report. It's horrendously complicated, so just give me a few seconds to explain it. What the scientists that wrote this did was they, they drew this line right down the middle from top to bottom on here. And they said, we're going to draw columns on this for all the things that we think humans are doing to the atmosphere that could change the temperature of the planet. If that thing is going to have a positive effect, if it's going to warm the climate, we're going to make it go to the right. And the more warming it's going to have, the bigger we're going to make that bar. And so, not surprisingly, when you think of CO2, it falls to the right, it warms the climate, and it's a big bar. It's a lot of forcing. It's the number one greenhouse gas that we have in the atmosphere. As we mentioned earlier, there's other greenhouse gases that are in the atmosphere. They're all warming, just not as much as CO2 is. What's interesting is when we get to particles and clouds. So if we say that we added particles to the atmosphere and those particles have spawned more clouds, now this falls to the other side. So these are different kinds of particles and they all have to be added up. And when you add them all up, you get a negative feedback. You get a cooling of the planet, just like that smoke cloud over Singapore. If you think about the clouds that are being formed, that's also negative. Not only that, but there's one other thing, especially for anybody that's taking science right now or is going to take science that's going on here that you should pay attention to, which is the uncertainty, the error bars. So for the students in the room, you guys are all going to have to talk about error bars at some point in a science class. You'll notice that this is large and positive, but we also are pretty sure about it. It's no less than this and it's no more than that. When it comes to the particles, look at the error bar here. It's huge. It's absolutely amazing. So our understanding of particles and clouds is much, much worse than our understanding of greenhouse gases. And this kind of makes sense, right? We've had people like Tyndall and Arrhenius working on CO2 and the other greenhouse gases since the 1800s, but really only in the last 50 years or so have we started thinking about particles and cloud effects. And so we're not quite caught up to them. I call this one other thing, which is job security, because this is what I work on, and most of my work is trying to squeeze these down so that we understand them better. When you add all of these things up, you can think about the year that this report came out. This is 2012, and you can see this large positive forcing. The error bar here, the uncertainty, is really due to not understanding the particles and the clouds, but it's large. You can also go back in time and sort of do the same accounting in years like 1980 and 1950, and you can see that there was a lot less CO2 in the atmosphere. So there was still a lot of warming, but there wasn't as much, and so that's smaller, and the error bars are also smaller as a result. For those that are old enough to remember, there were also a lot more particles in the atmosphere as you go back in time. We've actually been pretty good about cleaning up particles, and so there was actually more of a negative effect in years like 1980 and 1950 relative to the amount of warming that we had. So that was part of the equation. Okay, so let's sort of finish up uh, part number two. Again, just to recap, particles and clouds scatter more of this sunlight than they absorb or they trap heat. And the net effect of this is that we have a cooling. We offset some of, some of the global warming. It's not enough to get rid of the global warming or to have a cooling effect. It's just enough to cancel out some of it. Sort of like going to the beach and somebody throws a bunch of blankets on you, but then they put a little sunshade over your head. The sunshade helps, but you're still really hot from all the blankets that have been thrown on. Not only that, but this is really our area of uncertainty. This is why we don't understand climate change. 
So we can add all of these things up and we can have this observed warming. And what we can say is that that's really adding things together. It's the large greenhouse gas warming. Other anthropogenic forcings, these are the clouds and the particles. We add these two things up. This is the combined forcing, and that's pretty close to the observed warming. So in other words, we as scientists can sort of do the independent accounting of this, and it matches up pretty well with what we're seeing in the Earth's system. We're not missing anything large. We're not completely certain about the effect, but we're not missing anything. So, um, so we're going to change gears a little bit here, um, but I'm going to ask you uh, to, to explain why I'm doing it at this point. We're going to talk about what's called geoengineering. So who in the room has heard of geoengineering just by chance? Wow, educated crowd. So about half of us. That's great. So geoengineering is the concept that there's something that we as humans might be able to do to the climate system of the planet to change the temperature and somehow bring it back to this normal number. Whatever that number is. Remember we had this zero degrees C, the average number in some year. So if we acknowledge that there's some number we want to get to, is there anything that we can do to counteract the effect of CO2, greenhouse gases? All right, you're looking at this. You want this observed warming to go back to here. There's two things that you can do to try to get it back there. What can you do? Increase the greenhouse gases. Yep. One thing that you could do is drive this back to zero so that we're not emitting net any more greenhouse gases, CO2, and the other greenhouse gases. And you're going to get pretty close to the same temperature that you had before. The effects are going to keep going on for some hundreds of years. We're a degree warmer now, so we would still be a degree warmer than, when, than we used to be, but otherwise we'd be okay. What's the other thing you might consider doing? The other thing that's been proposed is you leave this right where it is. And remember, it's going to keep growing, but instead you put particles in and you keep increasing the amount of particles as a result. These are the two ideas behind geoengineering. So this is from a magazine, New Scientist. Um, it's a really nice image. And uh, it's kind of confusing, but they're talking about all of the different things that you could do intentionally to the Earth system to try to get the temperature back in balance. So largely, it falls into two blocks, the two blocks that you guys just identified. One of them is carbon capture, that you somehow find a way to grab that CO2, the other greenhouse gases, out of the Earth system and find a way to sequester them. There's all kinds of different things growing more trees. Um, you might create blooms in the ocean where uh, algae form, um, and that carbon gets eaten up, and then it falls out of the system. You could find trees, cut them down, cook them down to charcoal, and then bury it, and then grow more trees and keep doing this to pull CO2 out. So that's called biochar, and that's in the lower left. So these are all ideas of carbon sequestration. In the upper right are the ideas of putting more particles and more clouds into the atmosphere. And so we'll talk a little bit about both of these. Um, if you read the news or you hear about geoengineering, you might think about this as something that, you know, these scientists are just coming up with today, the crazy scientists talking about geoengineering. Turns out geoengineering is not a new concept. So this is a presidential report, and I've highlighted the year that it was written down here. Can anybody see that? 65. 1965. Administration. This is the Johnson administration. So this is 1965, and they're talking about restoring the quality of our environment. Deliberately bringing about countervailing climatic changes. So this is 1965. You might hear that there's this huge debate about climate change going on. During the Johnson administration, they have a report that they're already talking about climate change happening because of the increase in CO2, because of fossil fuel combustion in the environment. And they're talking about, can they do something about that climate change? A countervailing technology, a geoengineering solution. They talk about raising the albedo of the planet. So they've already figured out that things like clouds and particles reflect sunlight back into space. And they're talking about, can we do something to raise the albedo of the planet. Can we make the planet more reflective? They're not talking about particles, though. They came up with a pretty wacky idea. They wanted to throw white ping pong balls on the ocean. <laughs> so I'm not making this up. This report is you can jump on, on Google and find this thing. Um, so they realized that water, ocean water, is pretty dark. It absorbs a lot of energy. So they have this idea that they're going to make a lot of white ping pong balls. They're going to throw it on the ocean and that that's going to reflect sunlight back into space. 
<laughs> rubber duckies would work too. They, they're going to have to be very reflective. So, you know, tin foil, white, whatever. So um, I'm not going to make too much fun of them. Uh, it, you know, this is actually, they're trying to find a solution in 1965. It, it's kind of wacky by today's standards, but they've got all of the physics and chemistry worked out in 1965, and they're thinking about a solution. So it turns out that um, we have, as a country, tried to figure out solutions like this since then. This is a report by the National Research Council, the National Academy of Sciences. So this is a nonpartisan body that writes reports. They bring experts together and try to figure out solutions to things like climate change. So they wrote this report. This is about carbon dioxide removal, carbon dioxide sequestration, a couple of years ago. And so they note again that even as early as the 1930s, people were understanding that CO2 was responding to human activities, things like deforestation, CO2 being put into the atmosphere, atmosphere anthropogenically. And even by the 1970s, people were talking about trying to grow more trees to pull that CO2 out or sequester it from smokestacks, that type of thing. Again, this is the 1970s. So if anybody tells you that we're having this huge debate and there's all this uncertainty about climate change, there are a ton of people that are working on this 50 or more years ago, now almost 100 years ago in some of those cases. This is not new stuff. Not only that, but it's not science fiction. There's actually places on Earth that are already actively doing carbon sequestration. So this is a natural gas facility extracting natural gas in the North Sea. That natural gas is coming with a lot of CO2. Normally what people would do is extract the natural gas and just dump the CO2 in the atmosphere. So this is being run by the Norwegians and what they said is that's not acceptable. You have to find that CO2, you have to extract it, remove it, and then you have to find something to do with it. And so what this group did is they forced it back down into the oil and gas wells. And it appears to trap it. This has been going on for a number of years now, and it's stable. There's nothing that's, that's going on. It actually helps with the gas recovery. And so this is technology, a technology demonstration of what you could do in a case like this. In the couple of minutes that I have remaining, um, I'll just talk about this idea of adding particles to the atmosphere. So it turns out that there was not just one of these reports written a couple years ago. Um, the last one, remember, was carbon sequestration. There were actually two written. This one's called Climate Intervention, Reflecting Sunlight to Cool the Earth. And so the first report talked about removing that CO2. The second one talked about ideas for putting particles and clouds in the atmosphere. Um, I always think this is kind of funny, going back to my students. This would be like me assigning a final project and the students offering to give me two final projects. Has anybody in this room ever handed in two final projects instead of one when you were asked for one? <laughs> I didn't think so. The group said the reason that they were doing this is that they felt like these two things could not be put into one report. Carbon sequestration actually is based on science. There's understanding of it. There's been some examples done. There's been a number of years people have talked about these topics and investigated them. But this idea of perturbing the atmosphere in a very unnatural way, putting more particles there, or putting more clouds there, is something that we don't really understand. I'm going to say that another way. We have a history of seeing CO2 rise around this planet. We know what it did to temperature, what it did to plants, what it did to humans. Remember, we've got this record. You go back 10 years and it was at a certain level, 20 years and another, and so on. So if you took that CO2 out, we would know that we would just run back down that same path, very close to that same path. We don't know what the Earth system would be like if we put a lot of particles or clouds in it that shouldn't otherwise be there. And that's what the authors of this report said. They talked about the risk. I'm just going to very briefly tell you about what some of those risks are. If you put more particles in, you get more clouds. What do clouds often do? They rain or they snow. Not only that, but it rains or snows where those clouds are. That also takes water out of the system, so it changes the precipitation in other places. And so these are some simulations. If you actually put more particles into the atmosphere to try to change the climate, what would happen? There's certain places that would get wetter, there's also certain places that would get drier. So if you adjust that thermostat and you want the temperature to be something, what you also do is create more rain in some places and you create more droughts in some places. You might be happy with the temperature. Would you be happy if it didn't rain anymore in Boston? No, probably not. This is one example where they're talking about seeding marine clouds, making more clouds over the ocean when they, where they won't affect humans so much. The hot colors are droughts. Anybody know what this is here? 
This is the Amazon rainforest. This produces a large amount of the oxygen that we breathe around this planet. This is where a lot of the plants are. This is an extreme drought caused over the Amazon because you're trying to change the temperature of the planet. I'm very skeptical of this as a scientist when I see that. You should be too. I'll briefly say that there are some ideas for putting particles in the upper atmosphere, in the stratosphere, the next layer of the atmosphere up. We have some examples when this happens. Volcanic eruptions do this. When volcanoes erupt, we see the ozone layer go down. For those of us that are old enough to remember the ozone hole onset, this is because of particles and material getting put into the stratosphere. That increase in particles, that increase in clouds, would be a decrease in ozone. That ozone protects us from hard sunlight, ultraviolet rays, which cause skin cancer. Ozone going away, temperature, okay, more skin cancer. Anybody want to make that trade? Okay, I don't either. I'm just throwing these out there for you. One other one that's interesting, um, and this got brought up with respect to plants, is that if you put those particles in the atmosphere, it causes that diffuse radiation we talked about before. Solar cells like direct sunlight. They don't work well with diffuse radiation. So if you did this, you would get rid of one of the renewable energies that you're depending on to get you out of this problem. I'm going to say that once more. You put particles in the atmosphere, margin on solar cells goes away. You can't generate solar energy the same way. It becomes ineffective. And so you're not able to get the renewable. You would still have wind resources and things like that. All of those solar farms that you see as you drive the two west and places like that, all of the ones in the southwestern US, forget it. Not going to work anymore. So these are huge issues if you tried to do this. So I'll leave you with this, sort of the, the pros and cons. I'll just note that the problem with albedo modification, this idea of more particles and clouds, is that it has a lot of risks, some of which are known and some of which are poorly known. Whereas carbon sequestration, running back down, getting rid of that CO2 is a relatively well understood process, it's something that we've experienced before we have records of. So with that, I'm going to say thank you for your time. Um, I know we're right up against it, but I will stick around as long as you guys have questions. So please uh, feel free and thank you.
great point. More people like Dan. <laughs> and, uh, you know, to straighten us out, but just to be careful about these, the hoopla. Of yeah. What you can do to fix it. No, it's, uh, what is the quote about a little bit of knowledge is dangerous? Mm -hmm. So you guys got it, right? You looked at that one sure. plot that I put up and you said there's two things you can do and you came up with the fact that you could put more particles or clouds in the atmosphere. And so if you have a little bit of knowledge, you come to that conclusion. If you have a little bit more knowledge, you start thinking about ocean acidification. You start thinking about regional droughts. You start thinking about health effects. You start thinking about solar power generation and so on. And now you get to the point where maybe this doesn't become such a great idea anymore. And so if you're going to sell it, you can sell it by just talking about the positives, but you do have to ignore the negatives. And so very often, now you guys will be paying attention, but if you see an article come out about it, you can ask yourself, well, are they talking about this? Are they talking about that? And so on. And certainly, you can imagine, if I could give you a cheap technology and you didn't have to change your energy infrastructure at all, there's a lot of different people that would want to still continue to do that, right? So that also factors into the equation. Question in the back. Are the clouds any different than they used to be? They are. I had a quick note about that earlier, um, but I, I, I glossed over it in the interest of time. But we think that there's more, we, we know there's more particles now, um, but we also believe that the cloud coverage has changed. We also know that the brightness of the clouds has changed. And so, um, so we believe that they're different globally, but we can even see they're different regionally. So you can go to places that have pollution flowing out of them, places like Southeast Asia, versus other places that have the same meteorology but are less particles being put in. And you can see the changes in the clouds from the two pl between the two regions. So, so yes, they've absolutely changed. But are they different in this area? Oh, here in Boston. Um, so it's, it's harder to tell what they've done in, in Boston. Um, one of the reasons is if you go back in time, uh, we don't have very accurate records of clouds going back 100 years or 200 years. You know, we have notes that people took. We also didn't have satellites. So, so most of our understanding of changes has come since the satellite record, since we had coverage. And so those are changes that have happened in the last 30 or 40 years. And there haven't been huge changes in Boston. Uh, we've gotten actually a little bit cleaner in Boston, whereas we can see that signal in places that have increased pollution a great deal um, or places that have decreased pollution a great deal. Um, Boston is not actually one of them. Yeah, Thank you. no problem. Great. Why don't we close up? I'll stick around uh, if you've got any final questions. Thank you guys.